Our text this morning comes to us from the Gospel of John. This is the discourse of the Good Shepherd. And Jesus claims himself to be a shepherd. And a shepherd was not necessarily such a, a great thing in the first century. It was understood to be sort of a, a rather lowly type person. Kind of the equivalent of a carnival riot operator. Or a, 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 as Garrison Keillor likens it to a, a parking lot attendant. But that was not the, the history or the, the iconic understanding of the shepherd. For the people of God started as wanderers, as nomads, and they started as shepherds. And, and that, that identity of, of shepherds and sheep herding was critical to their understanding of what it means to follow God. And how do you follow God if you're not going anywhere? You follow God as you look for the green pastures, as, as you look for sustenance. And so Jesus here draws forth from that deep, profound theological understanding of the nature of a shepherd. Hear the word of God as it comes to us from the 10th chapter. I tell you the truth, anyone who sneaks over the wall of a sheepfold rather than going through the gate most surely, must surely be a thief and a robber. But the one who enters through the gate is a shepherd of his sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep recognize his voice and come to him. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. After he has gathered his own flock, he walks ahead of them, and they follow him because they know his voice. They won't follow a stranger. They will run from him because they don't know his voice. Those who heard Jesus use this illustration didn't understand what he meant. So he explained it to them. I tell you the truth, I am the gate for the sheep. All who came before me were thieves and robbers, but the true sheep did not listen to them. Yes, I am the gate. Those who come in through me will be saved. They will come and go freely and will find good pastures. The thief's purpose is to steal and kill and destroy. My purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd sacrifices his life for the sheep. A hired hand will run when he sees a wolf coming. He will abandon the sheep because they don't belong to him and isn't their shepherd. And so the wolf attacks them and scatters the flock. The hired hand runs away because he's working only for the money and doesn't really care about the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own sheep, and they know me. Just as my father knows me and I know the father, so I sacrifice my life for the sheep. I have other sheep too that are not of this sheepfold. I must bring them also. They will listen to my voice and there will be one flock and one shepherd. The Father loves me because I sacrifice my life so I can take it back again. No one can take my life from me. I sacrifice it voluntarily. For I have the authority to lay it down when I want to and also to take it up again for this is what my Father has commanded. When he said these things, the people were again divided in their opinion about him. Some said he's demon-possessed, out of his mind. Why listen to a man like that? Others said, this doesn't sound like a man possessed by a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? Just prior to this account, Jesus did just that. He opened the, the eyes of a young man, a man named Bartimaeus. And the Pharisees could not believe that his eyes had been opened. And they called in his parents and they had this little trial to make sure. And, and Bartimaeus simply said, this I know, 
I was blind, but now I see. I was blind, but now I see. And Jesus is the one who opened the eyes of this blind man. And then he makes this declaration saying, I am the good shepherd. Those others are like thieves who have snuck in and steal the hearts and minds of the sheep. And so what is he speaking of? If you look at Ezekiel 34 at some time, it, it speaks about the evil shepherds who have led the people away, who are not listening to the voice of God. They're, they're operating under the tyranny of the popular. And in so many instances, they're operating under the, the dictates and direction of the, the Canaanite false religion of the time. It was a, an ongoing struggle for the, the leadership of God to, to stay put in relationship to Yahweh as the one true God, as opposed to the false gods of Canaan. But they would simply listen and, and try to blend the two faiths, blend the two understandings, and not quite sound so unreasonable as the true prophets of God. For when those prophets would speak up, their voice sounded like, like fingernails on a chalkboard. It was it was harsh, it was, it was grating. It went against the vox popular, the voice of that which was popular. The voice of that which constituted the mainstream understanding of things. The, the voice of the culture. And Jesus refers in calling himself the good shepherd, he refers in contrast to Ezekiel 34. And he skips over 34 back down to Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. And so the people there listening to him, his disciples, begin to put all these pieces together. They begin to understand that in the midst of all of the many voices of life, midst of all the many influences, there is a voice to which they must focus and put their attention. And that is the voice of the Good Shepherd. Back in 1939, my father was working at the Fox Theater in Spokane. And Gone with the Wind came on the screen. And at the end of the movie, Rhett Butler said his famous phrase to Scarlett O'Hara. And Dad told me there were shrieks in the theater. Some people, actually, not in his viewing, but in other places, fainted upon hearing the D word in a movie. And um, oh my, how far we have come. <laughs> a few weeks ago, when I was visiting Peter in his room, we were visited while I was there by a man named Bob Mixa. Bob was a, Bob was a, a Jeep commander. And his Jeep, of the 32 Jeeps that were landing, pardon me, Jeep commander, tank commander, tank commander, of the 32 tanks that were to deploy on Normandy Beach, only four of them landed. Bob Mixa was the first of those four tanks that landed on Normandy Beach. All of the other flotation devices around these tanks failed. And so he was one of four of 32 tanks that survived. And so here I am sitting in this room with Bob Mixa 
and Peter Thomas, both of these men with their World War II caps on, talking about what had happened. So I took the occasion. I asked Bob, I said, Bob, have you seen the movie Fury? Which is about a tank commander and his crew. And he says, yes, I have. And he said, frankly, I didn't think I was going to like the movie, but by the end I liked the movie. But a couple of things bothered me about it. He said, first, I was nice to my men. We had to work together. We had to survive this war if we possibly could. I was nice to them. And he said, the other was that people just didn't talk the way they talk in the movies now. They didn't use that kind of, those kinds of obscenities. They didn't talk that way. And I hearken back to a conversation that Peter and I had had about six months earlier in which Peter said, well, there were some hells and dams, but none of this other stuff that we always hear in the movies. And that harkened back to a conversation I had with my father about five or six years ago. He said the same thing. So I see these movies and he said, guys didn't talk like that. This was a generation that came in lean off of the depression. They were on the very razor's edge of survival and they watched their P's and Q's and when mother said do, they did and when dad said don't, they didn't. And part of that was exemplified simply by language. It's a small thing, but is it? The, the vox populi, the voice of popularity, the voice of our culture, somehow redefines everything according to its own place and its own time. And so what gets read back into those incidents is not life as it was so much as life as we perceive it to be, wanting that life to somehow validate our own. And so we have a life, a culture, in which we have a very strong and transforming understanding of the, the voice of culture versus the voice of, of the faith. The voice of our culture versus the voice of our Lord. Jesus said, his sheep hear his voice. The sheep of God are drawn to his voice. But how quickly our culture has, has left some of the most fundamental aspects of what it means to be a people of faith. There was conformity for a long time in our, in our nation, and now there doesn't seem to be much conformity at all. So the voice of our culture is redefining truth, not as the voice of God, but truth is this amorphous reality that is shifting and changing, and, and as a matter of fact, may not be any more profound or transcendent than the truth within. So the truth within becomes the truth for that person. Is there no understanding of that which is outside us or transcending us or larger than us that defines the nature of truth? How do we how do we understand where, where life is going? How do we understand the nature of, of how we are to live? What is right? What is wrong if, if the only voice that matters is the voice within? Now, I confess that I, I do not understand the life of one such as Bruce Jenner who has a voice within that has redefined him. And this is a, a great mystery to me, and I'm sure it's a, a great mystery to those who are experts in such matters. 
but our culture has allowed for and adjusted the nature of reality in such a way that such matters of identity are so fluid that we might redefine who we are based on what we feel or what we desire. And are we defined by our desires? Is that the, the fundamental reality of who we are? It becomes a different voice. It becomes a different way of interpreting reality. If, if we are who we are based on what we feel or what we desire, is there no greater fundamental than that? Prior to the Second World War in Germany, the Nazi juggernaut was doing everything it could to redefine reality, supplanting the voice of the historic faith of the church with the voice of National Socialism. And Hitler himself appointed some of his own people to be leaders of the church. And the church in response declared, perhaps out of fear, perhaps out of misunderstanding, because Nazism was sort of the, the high academic understanding of reality at that time. It was the vox populi of its time. And so they allowed for this domination of the church, of the German church, by the Nazi regime. And over against this, three individuals, primarily Karl Barth, Martin Neumoller, and Dietrich Bonhoeffer, stood up and drafted a, a declaration that was to be a declaration that affirmed the voice of God over the voice of the state and declared that the state church of Germany was no longer the true church because it was no longer listening to the voice of the shepherd. And so they wrote, quoting from John, I am the way and the truth and the life no one comes to the Father but by me. Truly I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door but climbs in by another way, that man is a thief and a robber. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved. Jesus Christ, as he is attested for us in Holy Scripture, is the one word of God which we have to hear and which we have to trust and obey in life and in death. We reject the false doctrine as though the church could and would have to acknowledge as a source of proclamation, apart from and besides this one word of God, still other events and powers, figures and truths as God's revelation. And so the Confessing Church of Germany made this declaration that the one voice to which the church must adhere is the voice of the Good Shepherd. The one Word of God. Karl Barth made it through and died in 1963. Martin Niemöller was arrested, but managed to survive. Dietrich Bonhoeffer was arrested and executed just a few days before the Allies liberated Germany. These men and many around them stood for the voice of the Good Shepherd that the church is defined by the voice of the Word of God. That we have our identity 
given to us from outside of ourselves, given to us by our God who made us. The God who made us, the God who redeems us, and who will one day draw us and gather us into his sheepfold. Perhaps one of the most transforming passages of all of Scripture in my own personal pilgrimage of faith is John 10.10. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Which doesn't mean quality of life, it means a lot of life. A whole bunch of life. Life in all of its permutations and all of its challenges. Life that includes our our great pleasures as well as our great hardships. The fullness of life, the abundance of life, pressed down and shaken together and overflowing with his grace. That the promise of Christ is not that we would be somehow insulated, somehow separated from the realities of life, but that we might experience it fully. And so I am so heartened. Yes, when I stand before a young couple and I'm going to marry them and they look so silly. Their faces are flush. I just, I just married off Steve's son just a week ago and they were silly. <laughs> They don't know what they're doing. <laughs> and I love it. God brings them together with all of that, all of that stuff that, that God uses to bring, bring us together. And I'm also so heartened when I see a man like John Buchanan making his way into church after his bike accident struggling to live even with his pain and to continue on and to persevere in the face of it. And so on the one hand, we have the, the overwhelming joys of life, the deep and profound and mind-blowing pleasures that God gives to us. And then we have those, those deep, powerful anguishing, mind-numbing pains. And all of it together, the full spectrum of, of life. Our Lord says, I am the good shepherd. I am the one who leads you through. There is not a moment in all of it that I have absented myself from you so that you can persevere and know that I have prepared a place for you. Part of that understanding of that, of John 10.10, 10, of that magnificent verse about the abundance of life, was one that was in interpreted to me by my young life leader when I was a kid, telling me it wasn't about pie in the sky, I said, yes, there is pie in the sky. There is that reality one day. But the reality is that the, that the kingdom of heaven breaks into the present. And that we can live knowing the fullness of, of God's intention for our lives in the here and now, despite what it is that besets us, what struggles we may have that in the midst of it, we can still walk in the newness of life, newness that anticipates the new life with him and with the saints of God when that day comes. So we walk with our shepherd. He guides us. He carries us along. At times, he has to pick us up. At times, we're that one of 99 that's wandered off. 
and he comes and seeks us out and he carries us home. The voice of the shepherd. Will you bow with me in prayer? Oh Lord, thank you that we are not defined by the tumultuous realities of life, whether it emerges from within or from without. But we are defined by your will and that which we are becoming, that to which we have been called. Lord, in, in this, we find our great hope. And in you, we give you thanks and praise that there is such mercy. We pray in the name of Jesus, who is our shepherd. Amen.